always there, Father, and that it was your patience and your kindness that wooed me back, that brought me back into your fold, dear God, and brought me back to your arms. And Father, I just thank you for your faithfulness to me, even when I'm unfaithful to you. And Father, I pray that tonight where Brother Green is, I pray that, Father, your spirit would go before him, and I pray that every word that he says would be an oracle from heaven, God. And I pray that as he shares, people's hearts would be open to hear the good news and that, Father, they would be responsive to what you have to say tonight through him. I pray this evening that for myself, God, that as I share from the word, that, God, you would just remove the fear and that, Father, you would help me to express from my heart what you've done in my life. And, God, you would help me to share from the word and that you place Brian aside this evening and that, Father, your Holy Spirit would be the minister here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. I told some of you that you asked me if I was going to be preaching tonight. I said yes and said you might want to bring a book or something. Well, this is the book I was talking about. And let's turn to Numbers chapter 13. Uh, I told Brother Bob Batchelder, he asked me, what I was going to be preaching on, and I said, well, I'm going to, I think I'm going to preach on Numbers 13 through Joshua 6. Some of you know that includes a lot of scripture. Well, not exactly. I'm going to go back to Numbers and show you some things that are important to Joshua, and the title of the message is Entering Into God's Rest. It's, uh, an illustration of as the children of Israel entered into the land of Canaan and the significance that that has in the life of a Christian today. So we're going to, at the beginning, we're going to read a lot of Scripture. And then uh, we'll go back and look at each thing and what it means. So in Numbers chapter 13, from verses 26 down through the end of the chapter. Now what's going on here is that the children of Israel have reached close to the land of Canaan. And one member of each tribe was chosen to go into the land and to seek out the land and to take fruit from it and bring it back and to bring a report as to who was living in the land, how big they were, how many people they had, exactly where they were in the land, and to bring back samples of the fruit. And so the order was given and the spies went out and we pick it up there in verse 26. And when they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and shewed them the fruit of the land, and they told them and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us. This is uh, King James, so if my tongue falls out here, you'll know what happened. I meant to bring an NIV for this, but uh, you'll get the gist of it here. And surely it flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of a great stature. And there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which come out of the, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Now turn over... Skip over a few chapters to chapter 32. Beginning at verse 1. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw the land of Jazer, 
in the land of Gilead that, behold, the place was a place for cattle. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar, the high priest, and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, Adaroth and Dibon and Jazer and Nimrah and Heshbon and all the other things that I can't pronounce, even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. Wherefore, said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over the Jordan. And Moses said unto the children of Gad and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall ye sit here? And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord hath given them? Thus did your fathers when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to see the land. For when they went up into the valley of Eshcol and saw the land, they discouraged the heart of the children of Israel that they should not go into the land which the Lord had given them. And the Lord's anger was kindled the same time. And he sware, saying, Surely none of the men that came up out of Egypt from twenty years old and upward shall see the land which I swore unto Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob, because they have not wholly followed me. Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenazite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have wholly followed the Lord. Now turn over to the book of Joshua. Skip over Deuteronomy. In Joshua chapter 1, God appoints a leader to bring them into the land. In verse 1 he says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Now skip down to verse 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people... Shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them? Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. Now many of you know this verse. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, then thou shalt have good success. Then over to Joshua chapter 3, verses 2 through 4. And it came to pass after three days that the officers went through the host, and they commanded the people, saying, When ye see the ark of the covenant, of the Lord your God and the priests and the Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, about two thousand cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that you may know the way by which you must go, for ye have not passed this way before. And then in verse, and then in chapter four, verse one through seven, and it came to pass when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying. Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe of man, and command you them, saying, Take you out hence, out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones. And ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place, where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men, whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe one man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. Take you up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign unto you, that when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What meaneth these stones? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and that these stones shall be for a memorial 
unto the children of Israel forever. Now, that's the text. <laughs> and there's a lot of things that we could share, a lot of truths that we could share from this. But there's really just one thing that I wanted to draw out of this. Uh, I Sometimes when I preach from the Old Testament or share the Old Testament, there's always somebody, never fails, there's always somebody that says, yeah, but that's Old Testament. I heard, uh, shared with a guy and about tithing. He was asking about whether tithing was a scriptural principle. So I began to, you know, share some scriptures and show him in Proverbs the scriptures about bringing the whole tithe and, and that uh, so shall your wine presses be abundant. And I shared the scripture from Malachi, you know, shall a man rob God? And he said, yeah, but that's all Old Testament. And I thought, it's... <laughs> It's the Word of God, right? Uh, he said, well, I just don't believe that the Old Testament uh, has anything to do with us today. That's the Old Testament. We live in a New Testament. We live under grace. That's the law. And I reminded him that Jesus said, and look at this with me. Turn with this. Look at Matthew chapter 5. In verses 17 through 18, this is during the Sermon on the Mount. He says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Do you know what a jot and a tittle is? Have you ever wondered that? What's a jot and a tittle? If you don't learn anything else from this sermon, I'm going to give you a neat little thing that you can go away and say, I know what a jot and a tittle is. <laughs> At least you'll be blessed from that perspective. A jot was a punctuation mark. A jot gave punctuation, similar but not quite, to the apostrophe. A tittle was an expression of accentuation. It was to accent something. It gave it a, an inflection that you would say the word with. So Jesus wasn't even referring to a letter. He was saying that not even a punctuation, not one apostrophe, not one accentuation or inflection shall pass away from this book until everything is fulfilled. This book is the Word of God. Now, dear friend, if it was up to me, if I could, was on the printing presses, every letter in this book would be red. Do you have a red letter edition? This whole book should be red letter because this whole book is the inspired, divine word of the living God. Not just the New Testament, not just the words that Christ spoke, but the whole word is the word of God. And Paul said this word was given in order to be an example for us as that we should live our lives in godliness. I believe that, and this just came to me as I was studying, I believe that if you were going to express what the Old Testament is to the life of a believer, the Old Testament is a pictorial representation of New Testament revelation. Think about that. The Old Testament is a pictorial representation of New Testament revelation. The stories and the things that we discover in the Old Testament are drawn out, beautiful examples of what God is trying to tell us in truth and show us in truth. That's why Jesus used the Old Testament to illustrate. As he was tested and questioned, he would use the Old Testament. And he'd say, yes, but this. And he always used the Old Testament. And so we shouldn't abandon the Old Testament and say, well, the Old Testament is old and and we need to stay in the New Testament. Boy, I, I, I like the New Testament because that talks about Jesus. Uh, so does the Old Testament. <laughs> the whole thing's about Jesus. And so the story that I wanted to share tonight is uh, an illustration of a truth in the church today. It's a representation. And what it represents, what I wanted to talk about, and see, I got lost here on my notes, but uh, anyway... What it talks about is there's a picture 
of the children of Israel and the journey, I believe, is a picture of the child of God and the stages that God wants to bring him through. Look at uh, the Exodus and what God performed. The Exodus and the children of Israel being delivered from Egypt is a picture of salvation. It's a beautifully drawn picture of what God does in order to save a lost sinner. You know, God told Moses, tell the children of Israel and the elders that this night they are to take a lamb and they're to offer the lamb and they're to take the blood and take a brush and on the door they're to apply the blood of the lamb on the top and then on one side of the door to the other. And dear friend, that's a cross and it's a picture and a prophecy that the blood is what will pass over in order to keep us from death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And that night, the angel of death took the firstborn of everyone who did not by faith apply the blood to the door. And that's exactly what Jesus does when he saves us. He says, take the blood, and here it is, shed for the remissions of sin. Paul calls Christ our great Passover lamb. He's the great lamb sacrificed in order that we might escape the penalty of death. And so do the Israelites, every one of them, by faith, have to carry out what God said. He said, if you do this, you'll save your firstborn. But if you reject by disobedience and you don't take it by faith, your firstborn will die. And so the Exodus is a beautiful picture of of our salvation. Look in 1 Corinthians. Paul comments on this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to refer to a lot of scripture so that you know I didn't read this in a liberal newspaper somewhere. This is from the Word of God. Amen. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7. He says, Purge out therefore the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed. And some scriptures say our Passover lamb. And so we see that the Passover was a picture of our salvation. The Red Sea is a picture, the Passover is a picture of our deliverance from the penalty of sin, which is death. And the Red Sea, as God brought Moses and the children of Israel through the Red Sea and he divided it and swallowed up Pharaoh, that's a picture of how God, through salvation, delivers us not only from the penalty of sin, but from the very bondage of sin and the bondage that sin holds on his children. You see, God doesn't just desire to give us a salvation token so that when we get saved, we have this token we redeem when we get to the throne, but he desires also to deliver us from the chains and the bondage of sin. And if you've ever been born again, you know what I'm talking about. Because there was a sin that held you in bondage. And there's some sins that hold us to bondage even after salvation. But God has power not only to deliver us from that penalty, but also from that bondage. When God saved me, there were many things, that many sins and many areas that I felt just could not be forgiven. I felt, I know God has given me salvation, but I didn't believe he could ever deliver me from an unclean mind. And I found that he told me in Romans that if I lay myself on the altar, that he'll renew my mind. And, and it's beautiful how God shows us that he's powerful enough to deliver us from any bondage, no matter how trite you may think it is. Any bondage. God has the power and the authority be able to deliver us from that. And so the Passover is a picture of the deliverance of the penalty. The Red Sea, a picture of the deliverance from bondage. But what I wanted to look at tonight was, and ask yourself this question. It seems silly to ask, but it seems appropriate here. Why did God deliver the children of Israel from Egypt? What was his purpose? He could have, I mean, he's God, right? He could have struck down all the Egyptians 
and they could have inherited Egypt and run the show themselves. He could have had them uh, rise up in a revolt and overthrow. They were certainly uh, outnumbered. They certainly, the Israelites, could have uh, taken over had they uh, used God's power and fought them. But he didn't do that. God instead took them out of Egypt. What was the purpose? Well, someone might say because uh, God had heard their cries and wanted to deliver them from slavery from the Egyptians. No. Well, uh, because God wanted to get them out of Egypt because it was a horrible and wicked place and he wanted to take them away from there. No. Uh, the whole reason that God delivered them from Egypt was, first of all, it was prophecy. He told them that this was not the land that they were to inherit. He delivered the children of Israel with Canaan on his mind the whole time. God delivered the children of Israel for the purpose not just to bring them out of Egypt, but for the purpose of taking them into the land of Canaan. And so it is with you and me tonight. Everyone that's been born again, I know you get excited and it's wonderful to think how God has done such a marvelous move in your life and in your heart to deliver you from the bondage and the penalty of sin and to save your soul and to set you free. And we've all experienced it. Boy, you just get on fire for God and you're in love with Jesus. And man, you're a newborn Christian and you go out and you, you share the gospel with others. You don't know any better yet. And you begin to just share the love that flows out of your heart. And then... You begin to experience something I would call, and I've heard called, postpartum blues. You begin to see that it's not as easy as it seemed like, and you begin to, that first love begins to wear off, and you begin to wonder, uh, church doesn't seem to mean everything that it did before, and you think, well, revival's going to settle the issue, issue for me. Uh, my heart's cold because I need a good revival. And you sit through a revival all week and nothing happens. And you don't feel revived. And you still feel cold. And you still feel hard in your heart. And the reason is because you haven't entered into the land of Canaan. And you haven't seen that that's God's desire. He didn't desire for you to wander in the wilderness. He desires for you to enter into the land of Canaan. That was God's desire. He said, I've got a land flowing with milk and honey. Jesus told us that. This is not a new revelation. He said, I've come to give you life, and life, what? More abundantly. That's God's desire for every child of God. He says, I've come to give you life, and that more abundantly. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Isn't this good? Now, here in Hebrews chapter 4, he says it ten times better than I could ever dream of saying it. He expresses the same truth, and this is where this whole heart of this message is, is in this passage of Scripture. Verses 1 through 3, and then we'll read verses 6 through 11. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, I have sworn in my wrath that they shall not enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And then down to verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time as it is said, Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest, to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, 
to enter into that rest lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. You know, for a long time, I really thought that scriptures like this that shared about the rest and the peace that is for the children of God was for glory. But I began to examine the scripture here. It doesn't say that. It says, let us therefore enter into that rest. Now, either the scripture was lying or I was confused. And in my life, I found it's always I'm confused. It's never that the scripture lied. So I found that there was a rest for the children of God. And this is not a rest where you kick back and uh, you grab a root beer and A&W and watch sports on TV. And boy, you just enjoy it because you don't have to feel guilty anymore. But uh, that's not the rest he's talking about here. He's talking about an entering into the very promise that God gave. And he's giving an illustration here that the children of Israel, though delivered from Egypt, God had a higher purpose on his mind. And that was entering into his rest. That was entering into that abundant life that God speaks of that he desires for every child of God. Not just to be saved and satisfied, but to be filled with his spirit and walk in his love and his peace. That's what we need in the church today. I read you back in uh, Numbers, a story that I wanted to correlate with here. You notice, remember in Numbers, there was a group that came up to Moses and Aaron, and they said, you know, this place is really good for cattle. And what do you know? We have cattle. And uh, don't make us cross over the Jordan with you guys. And I know you have this wonderful mission and everything like that. And, and we're all with you, and we'll send some gifts with you and everything. But, uh, man, we'd just rather stay here and camp out here and let our cattle graze. And, uh, but don't make us cross over. And I like it how he starts out. He, he starts out like we all do when we know we're wrong in the first place. He says, uh, if we found grace in thy sight, Moses. This is the same people that said, who do you think you are as our leader? And wanted to stone him, right? And now he comes and says, if we found grace in thy sight, Moses, let us stay here, right? He realized, here we are at the edge of the land, and the fighting's going to begin. And they began to say, whoa, wait a minute. I don't need that. Let me just stay here. And I would propose to you that there's a lot of the church camped in Gilead that would just as soon stay there. They've been saved. They've been brought out of Egypt. They suffered through the wilderness, but they don't want to enter into the land. Why? Because it takes work. Why? Because it takes fighting. I heard one old guy say, you know, I figured out how to get the devil off my back. I said, well, how's that? I'd like to know. He said, uh, I just don't read this anymore, and he don't mess with me. Well, that's not the solution. <laughs> Amen? <clears throat> that's not the solution. Satan don't mess with you when you're not a threat. Amen? When you're a threat, Satan's going to come at you with everything he can give you. But what did God tell Joshua? Don't fear. Be of very good courage, for I'll be with you. And the people in the land, I love what Caleb says. Let's go up right now. Right now and take the land. We can do it. They're just a bunch of giants, eight feet tall. That's no big deal, right? Amen? And that's what God, God desires for the church. But many of us in our Christian lives have come up against the Jordan and we got knocked down. I've done that, haven't you? Haven't you done that? Said, I want to go deeper with God. And as soon as you prayed that, man, you couldn't believe what all happened in your life. And secretly, we don't say it out loud, but secretly say, God, you knew that was going to happen. Have you ever done that? You say, boy, I just wanted to go on with God and really do a work for the Lord, and my car breaks down. Thanks, Lord. You knew that was going to happen. Why would you let that happen, right? Lord, I, I, uh, 
I just made a commitment to read my Bible 15 minutes every day. And my alarm breaks. Thanks, Lord. All right? We come up against a little bit of struggle. And we start to work against God rather than with Him. And don't realize that suffering is a part of it. Amen? I heard Manly Beasley say, if you squeeze a lemon, what do you get out of it? Lemon juice. Wrong. Amen? Whatever's inside comes out. And sometimes God squeezes His children so you can see what came out. Amen? And so God wants to bring us in too that promised rest. He wants to bring us not only out of Egypt, but into Canaan, the land flowing with milk and honey. But it's not going to be an easy trek. There's going to be some war and there's going to be some fighting. So what is entering into God's rest? Well, I've just shared. It's when God takes His people on deeper with Him. I believe there's a, a time, and I could be wrong. I couldn't prove this to you from the Bible. This happened experientially. And I don't believe in forming truth on experience. But in my life, there was a time when God called me to be saved, but there was also a, a time when God called me to surrender 100% everything I had, willing to give up everything. And I believe God does that in every child of God's life. I believe He does that by His Spirit. And He says, I love you. I've saved you. I want to use you. How about it? And I believe he extends that. That's entering into God's rest. That's all it is. It's responding in obedience to the dedication. But why is this needed? Why is it needed? Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going the wrong direction here. Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. First of all, it's needed in order to live a holy life. He says, according as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. Why? In order that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. Why were you and I called? That's simple. To be holy. To live blameless in His sight. How can we live holy before the Lord by entering into that rest, entering into that time when we yield 100% in submission unto God and we lay ourselves on the altar and say, Oh God, if it's not for You, I can't do it. That's the only way that you can enter into God's rest. You know what the problem with a living sacrifice is? It keeps getting up off the altar. Amen? But you have to keep coming back. That's the problem. Every day. Every day. Boy, I wish I'd learned that lesson. <laughs> Amen. I wish I'd learned that lesson. So it's to live a holy life. It's also to be a living proclamation of God's grace. Matthew chapter 5. Back to the Sermon on the Mount. Verses 13 through 16. He says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor... You know, when I, was, when I was first saved, <clears throat> I hadn't grown up in a church, and I read that, and I thought it said Savior. And I was scared to death. I thought, man, when did I lose my Savior? I was scared to death. I was going to be lost forever because I'd lose my Savior. And then I uh, finally uh, got away from the creaking and groaning of the old the, uh, King James and saw the... Anyway, let's read this. <clears throat> the salt have lost its savor. Wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, as you read in Joshua, I love Joshua. It's a beautiful book of victory. I love the book of Joshua. But as you read, 
before they entered into the land, as they come against one of the cities, and I can't remember which one it is, they get a report back from someone in the city, and uh, the person comes out to meet them and says, Boy, we know, we know we've had it because we've heard how God did wonders in Egypt to deliver you and how God has come against the kings through the wilderness and you just wiped them all out and we know how powerful and strong you are. And so we want to join up with you. We don't want to be trampled on. And they made the unfortunate mistake of buying that line and allowing them to live. But... Uh, their reputation went out before them. I mean, before they even got to the land, the people were coming and saying, look, we know who you are. We know why you're here. Uh, can't, let's strike a deal. Hello? And, uh, you know, that's where our reputation needs to be. It needs to be a light that goes out before us. And the only way we can do that is as we enter into God's rest. Enter into that rest. Enter into the rest that God's offering to every born-again child of God and to offer ourselves. That's the only way that we can be able to be that light that shines in the darkness. I remember one time I was praying for someone that uh, was lost. And, uh, boy, I just didn't understand. I was pouring out my heart before the Lord and I said, Lord, I don't understand why this person does not get saved. They've heard the gospel over and over. And it grieves my heart that in the United States, people hear, have opportunity to hear the gospel. They don't even care. Uh, but they hear the gospel over and over and over, and they're not saved. And I felt the Lord speak to my heart and say, this world needs a whole lot less of hearing the gospel and a whole lot more of seeing the gospel lived out in the church. And I've heard that. I don't know about you, Jim. I've heard that so many times from lost folk. Well, I would be a Christian, except for this person I met, and this person I knew, and this person that said they were a Christian. It's gotten so that uh, Christian is... I, when people ask me, and I'm sharing with them, and they say, well, what are you? At first, I don't want to tell them I'm a Baptist because I don't want to bring up a denominational issue. I want to talk about Jesus, right? But I'm almost afraid to tell them I'm a Christian either because it's lost its meaning. It doesn't mean anything anymore. One old fellow said, are you a Christian? He said, yes. Why are you a Christian? He said, well, I was born in America, wasn't I? You know, and that's it's almost what people think it means. God wants to be a living light through His people to share His love as they enter into His rest. And then lastly, how is it accomplished? How do we enter into God's rest? How do we do it? And I believe that the formula is the same. I believe when you get saved by God's grace, you have to do it by faith and submission and repentance. And I believe that as you yield to God and enter into the promises that He's laid out for you, you do it by faith and by submission, prayer. And I believe it's the same thing. It's the same method. One of the keys I think that the church has lost a lot of, and that's fasting as part of prayer. You know, Jesus said, uh, they complained to, the, to Jesus that His disciples didn't fast. They said, now that... Disciples of John the Baptist fast regularly. But your disciples eat and make merry. And they were criticizing him for this. And Jesus said uh, that the... Who was it? Anyway, that while the bridegroom is with them, they do not fast. But when the bridegroom is taken away from them, in that day, they shall fast. And I think the church has lost the idea what fasting is. I made it... I, uh, the first time I ever did a serious fast on the Lord was during Easter because I thought, you know, Easter's lost its meaning to the world. And I thought, it has to me too. I don't understand all that's involved in what Jesus accomplished. And so I purpose in my heart, I said, God, 
I'm going to try to fast and commit it unto you on Friday about the time that Jesus was to have been crucified and not eat until Sunday afternoon after uh, resurrection. And I'm going to make it a fast unto you and I'm going to commit myself to this one thought. What would it have been like to have been a disciple and see Jesus die and wonder if it was all over? And that fast was extremely rewarding. One of the reasons it was rewarding was because it was during that fast that I met my wife. She wasn't my wife then, but I met her. Another reason was because God showed me in my heart what it would have been like to think that the Son of God and that was the worst. I believe it had to have been the worst period in the history of the world when the Son of God was in the tomb. It had to have been the worst period because at that time, there was no hope. The resurrection is the hope of the Christian, not the crucifixion. The crucifixion was a shedding of blood for the remission of sins. But Paul said... If he had not been risen, then our gospel be in vain. It's very important that there's an empty tomb on the other side of the world today. That's the hope of the gospel, that there is the resurrection of the dead and that we serve a risen Savior and that this day, right now, nail pierced hands reign on the throne in heaven and that He's alive. He's alive today. That's the hope that the Christian has. That's the hope of our salvation. And I think the first part of entering into God's rest and preparing ourselves is through prayer and through fasting and a fast unto the Lord to be dedicated to Him. It's also purging. This is very important. God told them, when you go into the land and you inherit the land that I've given to you through your fathers, Abraham and Isaac, you must purge the land and you must kill off everything that is defilement unto me and leave not one living. The men, the women, the children, the cattle, the livestock, everything must go. Now, at first glance, that's hard to understand. Well, God, those are, those are people. Why would they have to kill all these people? It's a picture of what God thinks of sin in His children's lives. When you enter into the land of Canaan, it's all got to go. Everything. It has to go. Nothing can stay. Everything has to go. Every sin has to be purged. It's the only way. God said it's got to go. Now, I'm going to fall off this thing, but you know I've got my anchor over here. I'm going to get away from this side. You know, there's some gray areas in every Christian's life that they wonder, I'm just not sure. It doesn't seem like a sin. But uh, I don't feel right. You know what the best test, and most of us don't do this for fear, the best test is to offer it to Jesus and to see if he gives it back. That's the best test. Give it to Jesus. And offer it up to Him and say, Lord, it's yours. If you would have me never to do this again as long as I live, that's okay. And you'd be amazed that God is able to speak to your heart. He's, he's not mute. He can talk. And He'll tell you those things. But everything must be purged. There must be a preparation to enter into God's promise. If you'll read in Joshua, he said, Joshua called a day of prayer and fasting. He said, consecrate yourselves. And he circumcised the children of Israel before they entered the land. That they would purge and begin to realize that they were God's elect, God's chosen. It wasn't up to them, their habits, their daily life, and the things that they do. It was up to God. And then the last thing is to put it to action. Turn to Acts chapter 4, and we'll close with this.
Acts 4, verse 31. The church is praying unto God here, and God moves in a powerful way. It says, When they had prayed, the place was shaken where they assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. That's what God wants to accomplish. Entering into God's rest is not for the purpose that we can sit back and be so blessed. Jesus is the great example. Do you believe Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit? Amen. Jesus was a perfect example of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Some people would say, well, things that Jesus did, He did because He was the Son of God. Wrong. Jesus was Son of Man. That's why He told the disciples, who do you say the Son of Man is? Because He wanted to show that He laid aside the deity of God Almighty and as an example to man, 